Greetings, everyone. My name is Father Joe Matern, and I am the founder of this Casa Esther Catholic Worker House in Amro, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us for this Lenten series on doing gospel justice. It will lead us into Holy Week of a in April, and the title of this particular series is Blessed Are the Peacemakers, which is a Lenten exploration of gospel nonviolence and why it matters. We thank you for joining us as well as thanking our co-sponsors. We send you our Lenten blessings. Enjoy the series. Good evening and welcome. I'm Dave Mueller from Cossest or Catholic Worker. A couple of things before we get started. First, we're gonna be doing something a little different with the Q&A session than we previously have done for this series. You'll still need to submit your questions and comments through the chat, and you can submit any time during the presentation. And then when we start the Q&A session, I'll invite you to turn your video camera on and unmute yourself if you, and to ask your question. Also, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the campus ministry centers of our sponsoring schools for making this series possible. The Turbo University in La Crosse, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois, Calumet College of St. Joseph in Whiting, Indiana, and Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. Loris College is also providing our Zoom platform for this series. So a special thanks to Bob Adams, the director of the Center for Learning and Teaching at Loris. We'll probably be doing a similar series next year. So we welcome the participation of other schools who have res registered for your series. Just uh, express your interest to me um, at the end of the series. So tonight is the sixth event of this Lenten series. And I'm excited to have my good friend, Martha Hennessy will be presenting on Dorothy Day and her vision and commitment to gospel nonviolence. As many of you already know, Martha is the granddaughter of Dorothy Day. Martha was born and raised in Vermont and she raised her family in Vermont and is now the grandmother of eight. Martha worked for 30 years as an occupational therapist and now splits her time between the family farm in Vermont and Mary House Catholic Worker in New York City. Martha is an important leader in the Catholic Worker movement in her own right, and she leads by her example. For many years, she has been raising awareness of the immorality of US drone warfare the prison in Guantanamo Bay, and the use of starvation as a weapon of war in Yemen. She is a member of the Kings Bay Plowshare Seven, all of whom served prison time for entering the Naval Nuclear Submarine Base on April 4th, 2018, and protesting the immorality and the implied of the possession and the implied threat of the use of nuclear weapons. Martha and I first met at a conference on Dorothy Day that was held at St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida in April of 2014, exactly eight years ago today. It was organized by the late Dr. Frank Sisius, and the conference turned out to be the catalyst that propelled the canonization cause for Dorothy Day, propelling it forward. And then as members of the advisory committee of the Dorothy Day Guild, we attended annual meetings in New York City over the past eight years. And in January of 2020, shortly before the COVID lockdown, Martha came to Wisconsin on a speaking tour and was a guest of Casa Esther Catholic Worker. Incidentally, Martha is interested in pursuing more speaking engagements in case you are interested in hosting her at your school. And so now it is my honor and pleasure to turn this over to Martha for a very special presentation. Martha. Thank you so much, David. And thank you all for being here. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to spend this time with you all. And with any endeavor, it's always good to begin with a prayer. 
So I have chosen a prayer uh, of Saint Benedict. Um, he, he is a special uh, saint in our uh, practice here in the Catholic Worker. Um, aura et labora it was his charism and uh, Dorothy was an oblate um, oh, as I am myself as well. Um, so the prayer of Saint Benedict in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Gracious and Holy Father, grant us the intellect to understand you, the reason to discern you, the diligence to seek you, the wisdom to find you, a spirit to know you, a heart to meditate upon you. May our ears hear you, may our eyes behold you, and may our tongues proclaim you. Give us grace that our way of life may be pleasing to you that we may have the patience to wait for you and the perseverance to look for you. Grant us a perfect end, your holy presence, a blessed resurrection and life everlasting. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. So I have um, put together a few, what I, have experienced as um, Dorothy's um, nonviolent uh, understanding, understanding of the nonviolent uh, gospels. And these are uh, just random um, thoughts and uh, writings that I've uh, gleaned, which I really uh, resonated with me, spoke to me. And I'll try and uh, present them to you in a, as cohesive a manner as I can, but I'll just simply start by saying, to God must we entrust our cause. And of course our cause is to change the social order. And that is uh, through our love of God and our love of one another. So Dorothy understood that Christ lived with the poor that the gospel was preached to them um, by Jesus. The majority of the world is poor people. So let's keep that in mind who, who Christ was, was speaking to and continues to speak to um, today. And let's also remember, and this, this is certainly an important part of uh, nonviolence with regards to materialism. Our material wealth belongs to the poor, not to war making. And Jesus went about in his ministry, healing the sick, taking care of the ill, the elderly, the most vulnerable, and associating with the unemployable, the poor, those who were just the least among us and the marginalized. Dorothy talked about uh, Matthew 5, our manifesto is the Sermon on the Mount, which means that we will try to be peacemakers. And of course, I may be getting that mixed up with Matthew 25. I get the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount mixed up. And some people have described the Catholic worker as the fruit of the Catholic Church and the fruit of Catholic social teaching. And Dorothy studied the lives of the saints. She didn't focus on the rise and fall of nation state states. She looked to the saints as the best examples on how to live, how to live a gracious life, how to live a Christian life. She was also quite aware of the war that we all have in our own hearts that we are up against every day. And a good part of our work is to really deal with, with that within ourselves. And of course, the antidote to that rancor that we have in our own hearts is to live with simplicity, to live a life of piety and to be serving the poor and of course life at the 
houses of hospitality is something that reminds us uh, daily of serving others, forgetting our, ourselves and our own needs and our own desires and our own wants, and just simply trying to focus on those who are, are so needy. I would say that that role is also the role of a mother and a wife and a woman um, in life, of caring for others, family life. I find the work at, here at Mary House is very similar to what I have done as a family member. So this, this simple giving of oneself is part of that practice of, of nonviolence. We also have the history of hospitality being provided um, in the monasteries in med medieval times in Europe. And Peter um, referenced that history himself also in his development of his program. And this is something that I, that I read from one of Dorothy's writings, um, but I'm paraphrasing, but simply to the extent of, you don't stand by when, when there's great human need, you don't wait for the state to take care of the problems and practicing the works of mercy will prevent a bloody revolt from the destitute and oppressed. So it's preventative. The works of mercy are preventative to acts of violence on the part of um, those who experience social unrest. I would like to read you what Dorothy wrote in April of 1948 and she titled it, We Are Un-American, We Are Catholic. And the whole question of how to live nonviolently certainly comes up in this United States uh, culture. And here she is just simply naming what the culture demands of us and how this ideology just leads, leads to a war, a permanent war economy, which is what we experience uh, in this country. So the quote, if we are to accept the materialistic and atheistic philosophy of the capitalist state, which holds sway in the United States, then there can be but little objection to this state of affairs. If our values are derived from the stock exchange, if we are to join in the psychopathic mania that has made war an end in itself, which has made it the norm of the American economy, if we are to be united against an ideology rather than for an ideology, then we are on the right track. And this reading particularly resonates with me today with this uh, current war in Ukraine. I just want to reiterate um, more important points that, that Dorothy tried to live out that all um, in my mind reflect the gospel nonviolence. We are called to be living members of the mystical body of Christ. And Dorothy had an, an incredible, immense sense of the mystical body of Christ. And this was also reflected in one of her writings from September of 1945, where it was a, a very lonely, um, enraged voice that she raised against what we had just done, the dropping of the bomb on Japan. And she spoke of and wrote about breathing in the dust of our Japanese brothers and sisters whom we had just annihilated. And to me, that speaks deeply, deeply of her understanding of the mystical body of Christ. Each human person is God's miracle. Not one person is expendable. Think, think about what that means. Our call as human beings, as co-creators with God, makes us stewards of creation. And how can we do that if we're practicing uh, violence? against each other and against our environment. 
we should be embracing all people of goodwill. We should be embracing good works, uh, no matter what different forms those good works come in. But let's, let's work and cooperate with people of goodwill who are attempting to serve God. Dorothy also spoke about fear. And I think that um, that plays a significant role in the, the leading up to uh, violence. And she prayed and she wrote and she spoke um, to the effect of saying, deliver us, O Lord, from the fear of our enemies, which makes cowards of us all. So it, it's not our enemies that we should be fearing. It's our fear of our enemies. And that certainly is being illustrated today with this business of drumming up fear against Russia. The poor are divine. Woe to the rich. We are the rich. And she does address that through uh, the teachings, uh, the gospel story of Lazarus. We are to find concordances. And this was a quote, I believe, from a Pope uh, John the 23rd. We are to find concordances, to learn to compromise, to move ahead together. All of this is uh, preemptive and preventative work um, to diffuse violence in our world. And of course, as human beings, as flawed human beings, our first impulse is always to make ourselves comfortable, to make ourselves safe, um, to address our own self-will, to have our way. And it's a daily practice to try and um, get that under control. And, and again, serving the poor is a very good way to um, address that, that self-will, that self-drive, that self-centeredness. We are to endure wrongs that are done to us patiently. And that's part of the spiritual works of mercy. Um, we are to be patient and, and to not lash out. But it's okay that we're not meek when it comes to complaining or defending others who are suffering. And I found that to be quite um, engaging you know, to think in terms of put up with um, slights made to us, but it's okay to speak up and defend those who are, who are being slighted, who are being oppressed. Um, Jesus certainly has required uh, mercy and love of us, from us, towards each other, not sacrifice. And we're called to be generous. We're called to have a spirit of generosity, you know, the sharing, the making of friends, the putting of ourselves on the line. All of this kind of practice um, contributes to living a life of nonviolence. And of course, with our Catholic worker communities, we try to keep the focus on living as family on one of the most uh, common words that I remember hearing from my mother Tamar and from uh, Dorothy was we need to practice loving kindness. And I think maybe the, the, word, the term loving kindness comes from some of the Psalms, but that gentleness, that altruism and that love, you know, as it's practiced in our communities There is no law for those who are washing the feet of others. There is no law that is written that tells us to do that. But we are called to do that, to wash the feet of others, to be the servants to others. Because the law of love is written on our hearts. And Dorothy always talked about the primacy of conscience and to have an, an informed conscience, very, very important. And we also talk in terms of anarchist pacifists. And what this means is we don't have ideas of domination, 
of, of exercising power over others, of uh, manipulation. And of course, all of this goes against the grain of our current uh, culture. So these are some ideas that I uh, pulled together most recently. I also want to take the time to review the uh, principles of Catholic social teaching because all of them are rooted in nonviolence and all of them, if attended to, would diffuse uh, violence, would diffuse the um, rage that comes from oppression. So let's just do a quick rundown of, of these principles of Catholic social teaching, the, the dynamite of the church, as Peter referred to, you know, the dynamite in the box that the clergy tried to suppress or to not uh, lay out for the laity to, to study and to practice. The dignity of the human person, all people are sacred, made in the image and likeness of God. And we have that belief in the seamless garment. You know, if that were truly practiced, that would bring more nonviolence and peace to the world. Community in the common good, the human person is both sacred and social. When one suffers, we all suffer. The, the mystical body of Christ is, is represented here. Rights and responsibilities, people have fundamental right, a fundamental right to life, food, shelter, healthcare, education, and employment. And this of course affects our domestic policies you know, in the realm of uh, political and uh, governance, and economic um, well-being. Option for the poor, the moral test of a society is how it treats its most vulnerable members, children, elderly, the ill, prisoners. The dignity of work. The economy exists to serve the people, not the other way around. Work that is life-giving, not war-making. Solidarity. We are called to work globally for justice. We are interdependent. We must practice enemy love. And the last one, care for God's creation. We are called to protect people and mother earth. To stop the destruction of our earth is our highest order of salvation. And I think that we probably could add to that at this point in time, uh, the, the, the twin threats of uh, climate collapse and uh, nuclear holocaust. So this is why we're speaking of nonviolence. This is why nonviolence is so imperative for us as practicing uh, Christians. And of course, in today's world, in today's culture, um, so much of our basic, basic uh, Christian uh, practice and understanding uh, gets lost. I would like to also read to you these are not Dorothy's words, but you know, we're here to talk about Dorothy and gospel nonviolence, but it, it all relates to uh, Christ and the New Testament. And it also relates to the papal encyclicals. I mean, Dorothy relied on those teachings as well to guide her in a, in a life of nonviolence. So I think it's important to revisit some of these. And I found these um, quotes uh, compiled in a booklet called War, Conscience, and the Rule of Christ. And it was put out by the Pox Society in England in the 1940s, I believe. But here is uh, a 90-year-old uh, quote from Pius XI's Encyclical of 1931, Quadrissimo Anno, I might be slaughtering the Latin name for it, but 40 years after. And this was written 90 years ago, and this is completely relevant today. Quote, unbridled ambition for domination has succeeded the desire for gain. The whole economic regime has become hard, cruel, and relentless in a ghastly measure. 
Furthermore, the intermingling and scandalous confusing of the functions and duties of civil authority and of the economic organization have produced crying evils. The state, which should be intent only on justice and the common good, has become instead a slave bound over to the service of human passion and greed. And one other quote, um, and this is from Pius XII, 1939, in Cesto Giorno, a quote, the international problems involved, and this was before the outbreak of the present war, World War II, the international problems involved were by no means unsolvable. And so I just, you know, need to say, with this current war that has been trotted out and fed to us and accepted by such a majority. Um, this is nothing new in our history. We, are, we continue to be faced with this fallacy of the necessity of war. And uh, Pope Francis, who is a Pope after Dorothy's heart, um, we have waited a lifetime, certainly for some of the teachings that he has brought forth. And we know that he no longer um, supports the theory of just war, um, of deterrence um, with the nuclear arsenal. That was a conditional acceptance 40 years ago. And, and it, it has all turned out to be just a, a mirage. Um, and he recently spoke about the current war in terms of the brutality of it and the sacrilegious nature of war in general. And of course, Pope Francis speaks about war as a scandal to be mourned every day. And in the face of war, we should weep, we should mourn. And so here we are in the season of Lent and it calls for a time of, um, penance, a time of quiet reflection, a time of trying to center ourselves on the nonviolent teachings of Christ. And we rely on the daily readings. We rely on figures in our history like Dorothy Day. We rely on each other, you know, to continue this study and to continue this practice. And I would just uh, simply end with another quote from Dorothy. And this was written in uh, 1967. It is not just Vietnam, it is South Africa, it is Nigeria, the Congo, Indonesia, all of Latin America. It is not just the pictures of all the women and children who have been burnt alive in Vietnam or the men who have been tortured and died. It is not just the headless victims of the war in Colombia. It is the fact that whether we like it or not, we are Americans. It is indeed our country, right or wrong. We are warm and fed and secure, aside from occasional muggings and murders amongst us. We are the nation the most powerful, the most armed, and we are supplying arms and money to the rest of the world where we are not ourselves fighting. We are eating while there is famine in the world. So I think you could put up that um, slide of the works of uh, mercy versus the works of war, Noel. Um, this is a beautiful piece of artwork by uh, Rita Corbin. And it's just very uh, clearly spelled out. The works of mercy feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, visit the imprisoned, care for the sick and bury the dead. And what the works of war bring to us is the destruction of crops, the destruction of land, the seizing of food supplies, the destruction of homes, the scattering of families, the contamination of water, the imprisonment of dissenters, the inflicting of wounds upon the innocent and burning and killing of the living. 
So thank you. That's what I have for now. And I know that we do have some questions that we'll revisit. And I just want to remind everyone that today's uh, readings uh, from the gospel according to John, um, the Pharisees say to Jesus, who are you? And Jesus's response is, I told you from the beginning, and essentially, you don't listen, you don't believe. And so that question of who are you, I would like us all to be uh, thinking about. Thank you. Martha, I was wondering if you, what you could share about your own journey during your life um, that brought you to this point. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. We all have our stories to tell of who we are, you know, the, the backgrounds that we come from. Um, the decisions and choices that we make in our lives and where that leads us. And, you know, for myself, I have most recently um, participated in what's called a plowshares action. And I was given a 10 month sentence um, for that. And, you know, I love to quote Megan Rice, um, a, a wonderful person in our community who recently passed away. But as an 84 year old nun, she participated in the last plowshares action previous to our own. And she talked about how her whole life prepared her for that action of walking onto Oak Ridge, Tennessee, a nuclear weapons facility, nuclear uh, plutonium storage plant. And I guess for myself, there have been many seeds planted along the way for me, you know, certainly beginning with my mother and my grandmother. Um, oh, I wasn't born in Vermont. I was born here in Staten Island, um, but was raised in Vermont, raised in the country, raised on a farm, very close to nature, very close to the changing seasons. And Tamar was a wonderful gardener and, introduced all of us to, you know, the good life on the land. So I came out of that very rich, very uh, anchored uh, background. And, and I'm very sure that that certainly helped me to be, become more prepared to become a, an occupational therapist, you know, to raise a family and then ultimately to uh, return to the Catholic Church. I was out of the Catholic Church in my 20s and 30s and 40s. But I returned to the church and then I returned to the Catholic worker. You know, after Dorothy's funeral in 1980, I did not set foot in Mary House until 2004. And I think all the preparation for all of these um, good works you know, how do we how do we listen to the voice of God? How do we how do we discern God's will for us in our lives and in our vocations? And that continues to be ongoing. Um, for me, I, I, I'm very appreciative of my community. I could not have done um, that um, direct nonviolent uh, action of. Uh, a sacramental action of denuclearization is how we like to refer to it when we walked onto the Kings Bay Naval Base. Um, I could not have done any of that without my life's preparation, my family, my community, um, my co-defendants. Um, so life continues to be an ongoing lesson. And the Catholic worker is certainly called a, a university of learning. And so all of that has led me to where I find myself today. Part of the um, plowshares movement, and I think there's been approximately a hundred different actions through the years. Plowshares, it's separate from the Catholic worker movement and yet a lot of Catholic worker people have 
have participated. And I remember reading some a quote from Father Dan Berrigan that he wouldn't have done what he did with his life without having known Dorothy. Um, so, I mean, Dorothy impacted the church and others well beyond, you know, those who participated in the Catholic worker movement. Um, but so, you know, in general with the, the, the plowshares movement, is there, maybe there, there's probably, people listening now that don't know a whole lot about the plowshares movement what what the aims of the actions are and some examples could you expound upon that a little bit sure the plowshares movement started in 1980 the first action um, occurred uh, about three or four months before dorothy died it was started by uh, phil and dan berrigan um, who were, well, Phil was a Catholic uh, Josephite priest. And what I hear from the teachings of Phil Berrigan is we have to start with a disarmament in our own hearts. And for me, that practice of participating in a plowshares action I, I felt I felt the need to uh, deepen my faith, and I felt the need to um, understand more about personal disarmament. And so these actions were they're based on um, Isaiah two four: We shall beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, and we shall study war no more. And it actually was born from the um, Catonsville nine action of. Uh, 1968, where they went in and destroyed um, draft files um, during the Vietnam War. So most of these actions have taken place either on military bases or in corporate um, facilities that uh, are producing the nuclear weapons. And there's the pouring of blood as a, a, again, a sacramental act of, we are to um, spill our own blood rather than taking the blood of the innocent. And we do a symbolic hammering on these weapons if we can get to them. Um, and the, the, the idea is to um, just make tangible what is intangible about bringing the body of Christ. We, you know, we've, we brought the body of Christ onto this naval base where the Trident submarines are housed and maintained and sent out from. And the purpose is to reveal these weapons systems and to let the public know that they exist and that they are on hair trigger alert. These Trident submarines can, they have enough firepower to kill the world many times over. And these uh, missiles can be launched and hit anywhere on earth within 15 minutes. And of course, they're now working on uh, really cutting down on the amount of time that the missiles are sent out. And so the plowshares movement is trying to uh, reveal all of this to the public and the massive amounts of resources and money that are poured into these programs of idolatry and utter destruction. I have a question, a couple of questions actually from Hannah. Hannah, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and, and turn your video on and ask Martha? Thank you so much, Martha. Um, I've got a couple questions from our student group here. Um, one question is, how is it realistically possible to avoid war, um, especially in the examples of World War II or maybe the current situation in Ukraine? And then the other question is, what is your advice to people who are new to the mission of the Catholic worker, especially thinking of our college students who may be just learning about this movement for the first time? Thank you. 
Well, I guess I'll, I'll try and address that first question, you know, this business of how to avoid war. And, you know, what, using that term realistic <laughs> in this context, um, to me is just so revealing in terms of our way of thinking and in terms of um, how restricted we are in our way of thinking. You know, how realistic is it to uh, live a life that's sane and, and normal and healthy? And so, you know, the question of this current war, I mean, there were so many uh, violations occurring on the part of the United States with regards to what is happening now. I mean, we, we are playing a major role in this current conflict. And we're made to believe that it's, you know, evil, evil Russian empire has invaded Ukraine. Well, there's much more background story to what we're currently seeing that is so difficult um, to be heard. But I would just say in terms of uh, solutions, you know, so realistically, we avoid we can avoid war by not using NATO to surround Russia. I mean, our, our goal is to take Russia out. Russia's border is half of the Arctic Circle, and this is a race for the last of the resources. So let's let's keep that in mind what the motivations are. But the solutions are an immediate ceasefire, to provide humanitarian aid call for the neutrality of Ukraine, which is, um, you know, they're being used. Uh, this is a proxy war and both sides seem to be willing to sacrifice Ukraine. Uh, remove foreign military weapons from Ukraine. Uh, resume negotiations for permanent settlement of internal conflicts in Ukraine with all parties concerned. And our Secretary of Defense Blinken, he is not um, meeting with his counterpart. These negotiations are being stalled or being obstructed. So realistically, where are we at in preventing war? Um, the United States has relied on war making for its entire history. So let's examine that and let's um, do penance for what we are responsible for. That's a good place to start if we wanna talk about how to realistically avoid war. And the second question for those who are new to the Catholic worker, I, I would just simply encourage um, people to visit houses and to read Dorothy's uh, primary, uh, the primary sources of Dorothy's writings, you know, to read The Long Loneliness, to read Loaves and Fishes, from Union Square to Rome, House of Hospitality, to read Peter Marin. There have been some good books recently that have come out to, to, to tell about Peter's life. You know, Peter is the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. To study his platform, um, to understand what the Catholic Worker Movement uh, is about. And I believe that young people, young Catholics, are very thirsty for hearing the truth, for seeing genuine um, efforts towards making for a better world. I would like to see our youth be given the power to change the world. Um, you do have the power to change the world and you do have the responsibility to manifest the good news. And living and working in Catholic worker communities can help you to, to learn these things. Uh, it's a hard life, it's not easy. And I understand that um, students today come out of college with immense debt. And it's not like they can take a year or two and volunteer and not be earning money. So all of these things are problematic um, for you. Um, but I would just encourage you to keep studying. We have a question uh, from Catherine Moore. Catherine, would you like to unmute yourself and turn your video on? Are you talking to me, Catherine Moore? Yes, Catherine. Do you do you yes, want? I, my problem as a Catholic is 
Poland is one of the most Catholic countries in the world and has suffered tremendously because of their faith as the um, Catholics throughout the world. And I find it so hard uh, trying to decide what to do when my country has gotten the Polish people to agree to putting nuclear weapons on their front. I mean, I don't know how to react to that. If I go against, if I, I do as this lady has done, and I admire her greatly, my cousin is an admiral in the US Navy because he needed a scholarship to go to college. He's Roman Catholic. And he took the exams for the military and he got a full scholarship to Annapolis. But now he's a man in his 60s and he's an admiral on the, you know, so what do I do? I'm so torn because my faith is so against the nuclear and yet my family is Catholic and Poland is a Catholic country. I don't know, it, it's a difficult question to ask uh, the lady who I respect very much, but can she give me some insight? Because I think maybe she went through that too. She loves her country and the world, but you know, my faith is first to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, it's a dilemma, certainly. And, you know, my brother was sent to Vietnam as a soldier. Um, my faith calls me to sacrifice. And you know, Jesus has given us the example of, you know, pick up your cross. And if we really want to truly work to understand these teachings of Christ, which are very hard teachings, and if we want to call ourselves disciples of Christ in the 21st century, um, we cannot we, we have to choose, we have to choose between our personal comfort, taking scholarships, you know, to study in the military or to go work at a house of hospitality and, and do those daily readings, do that daily Catholic practice and uh, live it to the best of one's ability. I mean, Dorothy did face failure. She felt that you know, this work was, and she was accused of trying to put a Band-Aid on a cancer, you know, with this structural sin and structural uh, violence. And uh, the, the question of people are suffering because of their faith. You, you, I don't know if you're referring to being persecuted by non-Catholics, but we're called to suffer <laughs> as part of our faith. Um, it's not easy. I, I, I don't practice it nearly as well as I need to or as I would like to. Um, we do fail daily. We're, we're faced with trying to forgive each other daily, multiple times. We must for, forgive each other 70 times, seven times and more. So yes, I, and, and I feel terrible about what's happening to very Catholic Poland. Um, you know, the, the, the neo-fascism that is uh, slipping in on many fronts, um, both in Europe and uh, here in the States. And what can we do other than practice our faith the best we can, attending mass, studying the gospel readings, and looking to exam to, for good examples in our lives. Martha, one more question before uh, we have the college groups uh, log off for their discussions. Um, and I'll ask this on Noel's behalf. Can you talk a little bit about 
Dorothy's involvement with women's rights. Involvement with women's rights. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think she was beyond this women's liberation movement, you know, in the 1960s, it was very hard with, you know, birth control coming on the scene, and you know, sexual promiscuity happening and she had to deal with it in her own grandchildren. Um, I, I, you know, I'm no, I'm no scholar on this, but you know, so are women to be liberated so that they can live the same kind of oppressed lives that men have? Um, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, you know, fitting into the work model in a capitalist society is, you know, you pay your war taxes, um, you participate um, in this machine and are women wanting to have an equal stand in that same model? Um, you know, the whole issue of abortion, you know, no longer being criminal or illegal, but perhaps it may return to that. You know, we don't need to be given terrible choices. Um, and I think what Dorothy tried to do was, you know, she was a woman in the field of journalism. It was um, not at all usual. She had to face all of the things that women typically have to face in a, in, in a patriarchy in a male dominated world. Um, but it's, it's the sanctity of, of, of motherhood and being givers of life um, that she tried to um, raise up as, as holy and, and to be protected. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just maybe add to that. I mean, her first arrest and, and uh, jail time was uh, demonstrating for women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think in Washington, DC. Yes. Um, so, all right, well, listen, we would like, Noelle, if you can post the questions for the discussion groups, um, you start their discussions with, I did not get a chance to send these around, uh, but they're short enough, uh, you know, please copy them down. And I'd like Martha to kind of expound a little bit about each question, how to approach it. Thank you. Well, the first question, who am I? And that was asked of Jesus in today's readings. Who are you? Um, I, I guess I would just want to um, say, you know, our human existence, you know, get, faces us with that question. Why are we here? Uh, who are we? What is the, our purpose in being here? So I, I think it's always a, a good exercise to examine our own lives to to understand our own particular family milieus that we come from you know what what our geography is where we grew up um what what has made us who we are as each beautiful individual creation that god has has made in each of us so who am i is is you know to know thyself to explore that and the second question, what happened in my life to that, that really helped influence the choices that I made, you know, to really begin to understand our decision-making processes and, and, you know, how did I end up where I am today um, doing a plowshares action? Um, it, it's a good exercise to, you know, why did I choose the profession of occupational therapy? Um, and all of those choices have major implications in, in terms of how we end up living our lives. And of course, the, the, the third question is, where did these choices uh, lead us to? So I was just hoping to give the young people a way of exploring um, who they are and who they want to be. And, you know, Christ calls us to all of our own individual um, vocations, and I'm hoping to help facilitate that process of exploring 
what we're here for. All right, thank you. And um, so now we invite the college groups that typically break off into their own discussions. Um, if you'd like to log off and, and begin your discussion. In the meantime, we'll take about a 90 second break and we will return with uh, more questions. So please feel free to submit more questions into the chat and uh, we'll be back soon. Thank you. And we will continue with some questions. Um, David, did you want to invite everyone to turn on their camera at this point? Or, oh, yes, or? yes. Yeah, if, if everyone would like to turn on their cameras, um, we can be a little bit more casual at this point. Um, if you do submit a question, we call upon you, keep, please keep it brief um, so we can cover as many questions as possible. And I would like to call upon uh, Linda. Um, would you like to ask your question of uh, Martha? Yeah. You go ahead and Linda uh, Modica. Modica. Modica, okay. It's Modica, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Martha, it's an um, honor to be with you all, you and, and everyone else in, in this um, gathering. I was wondering uh, what kind of relationship if any, did Dorothy Day have with Thomas Merton, um, either when he was um, a student at Columbia? Uh, did he visit the Catholic Worker House? Um, uh, have, did he volunteer there while he was a young man? Uh, uh, did he, and then afterwards when he became a, a nun and a, and a prominent anti-war activists. Uh, were they in correspondence um, with each other? Would you know? Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm no expert on any of this, um, but what I do know from common, common knowledge, I don't believe he ever volunteered at the worker. I'm not sure that they ever met in person. I'm thinking that they didn't but he wrote articles for the Catholic Worker paper in the 1960s. Um, they were close, they loved and admired each other and they shared uh, of their lives uh, with each other. Um, that's about all that I know. I mean, I'm sure that there are other uh, folks who have studied um, Merton himself, um, but I don't believe that he ever came to any of the houses. I mean, he was kept in the monastery. Mm -hmm. I think I could add to that. I think they had correspondence by letter for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, he, in the beginning, was not an anti-war activist, but over time, he he came out strongly against the Vietnam War or involvement there. Um, Dorothy published a lot, many of his letters and articles. Um, at times, he had to write under a pseudonym, so it wasn't always uh, evident that it was uh, Thomas Merton writing the uh, the article. But um, yeah, I, I attended one time uh, a talk by the late. Um, Jim Forrest, who talked specifically on their relationship, and he he emphasized that they they never did meet each other, but um, had that close relationship through correspondence. Sorry, all right. If I ask a question, yep. Um, now, Dorothy Day was a journalist and was very diligent in that life. And it was a coverage I thought of when she went to Washington that actually was like a transformative moment for her. And I think, I'm not sure that that was, uh, uh, you know, I'm involved in the uh, Poor People's Campaign that's coming up uh, in June. 
and uh, we're planning up uh, getting a bus together from Northeast Tennessee to join that uh, June 18th. Um, and I believe that was also a, a similar sort of action. And it was, if I remember correctly, that was kind of like a transformative moment where Dorothy just felt the, the helplessness of the people there. And could you just expound on that and just correct my memory? <laughs> That's correct, Martha. Yes, thank you. Yeah, she was put on assignment to go down and to cover the Hunger March, it was called, in 1932, December of 1932. And, you know, these were displaced farmers and workers, and they were very badly treated. In fact, they were kept on the side of the road for several days in very cold weather, not even allowed to come into Washington, D.C., and she was sent down, I'm not sure if it was Commonweal or America that she was writing for at the time. And, you know, standing by the sidelines watching, you know, the misery of these citizens who are not well taken care of. And Dorothy knowing that the Communist Party was trying to meet the basic needs of, of the workers, whereas the capitalists were certainly not doing that. They were exploiting the workforces. And so, you know, she felt this loneliness of now being a Catholic and the Catholics were just not addressing, the Catholic US Catholic Church was not addressing this issue of the condition of these families. And she went to pray in the crypt of the national uh, shrine that was not built yet. And that was where, you know, she prayed to God to help her find a way of applying her skills and her vocation as a journalist um, and her new Catholic faith, how to, do, how to become a servant of the people, how to share of her um, skills to, um, to contribute to the well-being of others. And, it was after that that she returned home to New York to her sister-in-law's apartment, and there was Peter Marin. So her, her prayers were answered by, um, and Peter was sent to her by uh, George Schuster of uh, Commonweal, I believe. And he, he sort of knew both of them and thought, well, they should meet each other. And of course, the rest is history. I'll uh, expand on, ask another question if that's okay, but I want to let people know just, you can just wave to us if you want to ask a question or use the reaction button and, and raise your hand that way. But uh, I find it almost ironic that Dorothy Day was a journalist and she was so well informed about what was going on in the world that I find that myself, um, it's very difficult to find out what's going on in the world because it's coming through such a, a filter. So it's, um, and you know, the, the journalists of today are almost becoming an endangered species. Uh, you know, if they want to report something that's not in line with the capitalist or the corporate um, media. And um, I'm just, uh, you know, how do we get how do we get access to information? I mean, you're so well informed. How do we get that information that uh, you know we really need to hear? Does that that's kind of what I'm thinking? Yeah, the the media is uh, playing a significant role right now in this war machine. Um, I don't know how well informed I am, but you know we do have the internet. And I do look at alternative um, media. And, you know, if I find certain perspectives being um, cross referenced by different journalists, then I feel more comfortable in knowing that these are facts that, 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 that can be relied upon. But it's, it's not easy. It is not easy at all to really find out what's going on in the world. But um, you better believe that it's not good. And it's very hard for Americans 
you know, we're seeing dead bodies on the front page of the New York Times now, and these are white Ukrainians. Well, for the last 20 years, they have not been showing us the dead bodies of people in Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Iraq. So. It looks like we have a student that Loris that would like to ask a question. Hi, um, we had a couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, both like as individuals, but also as a country, how can we support the Ukrainian people without contributing to violence? Um, and the second question is, um, is it possible that having nuclear weapons has possibly reduced the amount of wars just out of um, trying to avoid nuclear retaliation, which would obviously be very devastating? Thank you. Um, how do we support the Ukrainians? Um, well, we can stop sending weapons there. You know, we're, we're sending weapons there. And that's um, not what they need. Um, it's very hard. I mean, we have um, Joseph Biden, our president, you know, saying things. I'm just trying to find some of my uh, notes that I've been taking. Joe Biden most recently said to the to to um, the situation that that Russia and Putin, this is an unprovoked brute force and, and disinformation to satisfy a craving for absolute power control. And another quote, don't even think about moving on one single inch of NATO territory. This is our president speaking. And it is NATO that has infringed on the borders of Russia. So we really have to look at the truth of what has led us to this situation. And we talk about the splinter in the other person's eye, and we need to look at the log in our own eye, this unprovoked brute force and disinformation. This is what the United States has been practicing. And we also have this uh, narrative that we're trying to bring democracy and we're opposing autocracy. And all of this uh, has to be examined. So in order to support Ukraine nonviolently, um, support the citizens who are, and I don't know how we support, you know, the Russian citizens and the Ukrainian citizens who are saying, we don't wanna participate in war. They're, they're being pretty severely oppressed. It's important that we know that, that we support those protesters, those conscientious objectors. And stopping the arms sales is, is critical. And of course, it's good to send money and it's good to send food. And there are a lot of donations being collected to send there. But as, as American citizens, US citizens, we need to get out on the streets and demand that the US negotiate for a ceasefire and to stop this conflict. That's the most important thing that needs to happen as soon as possible. And that's what Pope Francis Pope Francis is trying to work on as well, to, to play some kind of role in negotiations and ceasefire. And as far as your question was about uh, nuclear deterrence or nuclear weapons, you know, we have all of these treaties that we have been violating over the decades. And what, what, the US citizens really need to do is to just get out in the streets um, and demand that the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons um, be signed and that uh, these missiles be removed from places like Poland and Romania. And let's also educate ourselves about the Pentagon has been operating on the premise of providing the first um, strike. You know, we're, we're not talking about defensive um, mechanisms here. We're talking about an offensive stance. 
and we are trying to, our Pentagon is trying to figure out how to accomplish the first nuclear strike without Russia having the capacity to retaliate. And we just need to be honest with, you know, who's the aggressor here? Um, and it's, it's not easy to get this information, um, but it's very important that we, that we try to figure out the facts of what actually is going on. Martha, I think a lot of people don't realize that as a country, we've never committed to a policy of no first strike. Right. So we've always kind of held that out there as kind of a, um, kind of a way to, uh, not sure what, how to say it, in, to intimidate. Black uh, men. Yeah, exactly. Um, a good book to read on this is by um, Daniel Ellsberg, published a few years ago. I think it's called The Doomsday Machine. Is that? Is that yeah. right? We carried that book onto the base and left it there. Yeah. Um, Daniel Ellsberg, as some of you remember, was the, um, released the Pentagon Papers uh, back during the Vietnam War. He had also collected during that time while he was still working in the CIA, he had collected a lot of data on um, our nuclear weapon policies. And recently, a few years ago, wrote a book using these materials. Um, how about any other questions? Uh, Okay, Linda, it looks like you have another question. Go ahead. Yes, I was, I was wondering if Martha would, um, um, well, you would almost certainly know if there are any of the Catholic worker farms uh, in Peter Morin's vision um, still operating. Uh, I thought that it was brilliant, a brilliant concept of a, of a, type of a university on the farm. Um, and I was wondering if those still existed anywhere in the country. Thank you. Yes, yes, there, there, are, there are Catholic worker farms. Um, there's a lot out in the Midwest, but young families who are getting back to the land. Um, Peter Morin's vision was one of agronomic universities and there are certainly uh, groups of folks, uh, I'm not remembering the name of the community, but Eric and Glada and Rena Custons, they're doing a lot of work with educating about um, growing of food. And, and we have our own farm here, up uh, an hour and a half north of the city in Marlboro, New York, the Peter Marn Farm. And we do our best oh. to grow foods and you know have vegetables sent down to the city for the soup vegetable soups that are made on a daily basis here so yes the the ideal is out there and being implemented in at different levels of success i would say wonderful thank you and uh and i wanted to also thank you for mentioning a, a woman who was really dear to me too sister megan rice before um and in an in kind of a response to to um, Noel's question and the students' question before, I keep a poster that Sister Megan had made when she came to visit us in Johnson City at St. Mary's Church. The real truth is what um, she she taught, and she was a great teacher, as you know. Um, and where to get that information, places like Oak Ridge Environmental Peace Alliance, uh, Reaching Critical Will, uh, Nuclear Watch. Uh, those are the places to, uh, that she recommended and that and learning from her, um, I go to uh, for a informed view of nuclear weapons and the threat that they mean to all of us and how they have enabled this current war. Uh, so thank you. Um, thank you, Martha. Thank you all. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, it's 20, almost 25 minutes or 23 minutes after the hour. Um, I think it's time we can wrap up. Uh, thank you everybody for your participation. Thank you for your questions and comments, and especially a thanks to uh, Martha. Martha always, uh, whenever I've uh, listened to her presentations is always very challenging, but it's always based on the teachings of Christ. And it's not easy to follow the teachings of Christ. And, and Martha always is able to emphasize that. Um, next week, our final session, our final event of this Lenten series, Marie Dennis from Pax Christi International will be talking uh, on the church's return to gospel nonviolence. Uh, Marie was very instrumental in organizing two conferences between Pax Christi International and other peace organizations. Uh, over at the Vatican with the depart with the uh, Office of um, of Human Rights, and um, they made a lot of progress in terms of a dialogue on just war theory, and a dialogue on active nonviolence. And uh, at, they had a conference in 2016, and then one in 2019. At the 2019 conference, they presented uh, writings that they're hoping. Uh, Pope Francis might use for an encyclical someday on the topic of active nonviolence. So um, be sure to come back next week. Once again, thank you, Martha, and everybody have a good night. Thank you.